This is actually an interesting, the, it follows very nicely on from Bob McFerrin's talk, but a little out of place in the rest of the session in that I'm mainly going to concentrate on comparative planetology. And one of the things that we're concerned about with comparative planetology is in fact atmospheric evolution, which is sort of an aspect of, a big aspect of planetary global change. So it's something to think about. Um, I want to acknowledge Chris Russell, Janet Lumen, Tom Moore, John Foster, Stas Barabash, and Hans Nielsen. A lot of the ideas that I'm presenting here, I um, either developed or stole from them, what would be through discussing them or stole them from them. So the outline is this. Um, start with the big picture, comparative planetology. The, the issue we're talking about is atmospheric evolution. And the question is, what is the rate of water loss from Venus and Mars, the reason why everybody cares about that is you need water for life. And so why are Venus and Mars so dry and the Earth so wet? And does the contemporary oxygen ion outflow, which is what a lot of people use in measurements in space plasmas, they'll use the oxygen outflow rate to say that tells me the rate at which water is lost from the planet. I'm going to address that idea as well. And last, the idea of does an intrinsic magnetic field in fact inhibit the loss of basically oxygen is what we're really looking at, but the loss of the heavy ions from the planetary uh, ionosphere and then hence ultimately from the planetary atmosphere. I will then divert more into discussion of terrestrial outflows, Just spend a little bit of time on the MI coupling aspect that, we, that is part of what's going to go on with the rest of the session. And basically, if I don't spend enough detail on this, point out that of those statistical correlation analyses that we've done, the single best predictor of outflow rates is the precipitating electron density. If you have to pick one number and one number only, it's going to be electron precipitation. The trouble is, that's the hardest parameter to make a parameter parametric study of in that it's the precipitating electrons depend on a lot of other processes to give you what their flux is. So it's hard to think about how you would put that into a model in an ad hoc way. Uh, there's also minimum flux, which I think is the polar wind. There's a maximum flux, which may be a source limit. This goes back to something that John Foster talked about yesterday. I'll bring that point back. And we'll also talk about the global outflow rates from uh, Yao and Andre, uh, uh, their review paper. They have a rate of 10 to 24 to 10 to the 26 per second. I want you to remember that number. I average that to 10 to the 25 because I like to keep things simple. But something of the order 10 to the 25 per second is the oxygen outflow rate averaged over the northern and southern Polar ionospheres for the Earth. Venus and Mars, no magnetic field, but at Mars, neutral disks can escape. At Venus, they cannot. There's not enough energy in strictly neutral interactions to get you an escape velocity for heavy ions. But the heavy outflow, ion outflow rates at Venus are about 10 to the 25. And at Mars, a few times 10 to the 24. You're beginning to see similar numbers. And that, I think, is probably telling us something. And I'm not sure what it is yet, but it's something we need to think about. But it also makes us wonder is how did the atmospheres evolve? If we're going to keep putting these as being water loss rates, why is the Earth wet and why is Venus and Mars dry? Because these rates right now, the contemporary rates, are about the same. And I'll also give you an argument that says why in unmagnetized planets you can limit, you can give a back of the envelope calculation that says you can restrict the amount of outflow you're going to get by the amount of solar wind momentum flux coming in. All right, so what determines the rate of water loss? I, I am not a geologist, so I'm copying this from other people's ideas. Obviously, hydrogen can escape very easily. It's the lowest atom, mass atom it can go. There's nothing holding a hydrogen back, neutral hydrogen back. So if that were the case, all the planetary atmosphere should be losing hydrogen. And we should be, all the planets should have oxidizing atmospheres. They don't. Why not? The idea, and this is sort of a curious argument, the idea is because oxygen can't escape so easily, it somehow acts as a choke on the loss of hydrogen. They call this self-regulation. The process I don't think is well known. In fact, I don't even know if they can really describe it. The idea is you can't let the hydrogen escape because if it did, you have a very rusty planet. The planets aren't all completely oxidized. So somehow the oxygen managed to be a throttle or a choke on the hydrogen outflow. We call it self-regulation. 
This argument applies on geological timescales. Not, it's short timescales, geological timescales. For Mars, it's 10 to the 5 years. Not 1, 10 to the 5. So, why do we make, why do we make the assumption that if we know the oxygen out rate, we know the water flux now. It's got to reach too far down through the ionosphere atmosphere, and the atmosphere to the reservoirs to have that rate be directly controlled right now. So I think that's a, I think that's a fa personally, I think that's a fallacy to make that assumption. But people do make that assumption quite a lot, especially for Venus and Mars. They get the oxygen outflow rate. They say, that's the water loss rate. This is why Venus and Mars is dry. And this is the argument that goes on here. So where did the water, if you believe that this, the water was lost, where did the water go? This is, in my view, a false syllogism. But here it is. Venus and Mars are dry, the Earth is wet. Venus and Mars have no active dynamos, the Earth does. Therefore, the presence of an active dynamo acts to shield the planet from the solar wind and reduce the loss of water. I believe that's a false syllogism. I'll show it again. Because the rates right now are the same. That's an important point. But not, they're not orders of magnitude difference. They're the same. The counter argument, and I also credit Tom Moore for this argument, is the intrinsic field magnetic, magnetic field, it basically increases the size of the obstacle to the solar wind. Instead of being about one planetary radius, uh, you know, for a, for a cylinder, it's 10 planetary radius, you know, 20 planetary radius in diameter. It's a factor of 100 bigger in area, the obstacle. That means there's more momentum and energy available from the solar wind to drive loss processes. Reconnection couples the polar ionosphere, we, George Reed talked about that, couples the polar ionosphere to the solar wind. It ends up focusing the energy into the polar ionosphere. So energy deposition in open field lines allows for heating and outflow. So it both shields low latitudes, but enhances the energy flux to high latitudes in the polar ionosphere. So some of the outflowing plasma escapes. Tom Moore, uh, sorry, uh, Tom Hill would ask how much of that outflow escapes, and we'll come to that in a little bit. But basically, it is a, at least a possible alternative pathway for loss beyond direct scavenging of an ionosphere by the solar wind. Numbers for context. There's that 10 to 25 per second again. I threw that up there because that's the canonical number that seems to apply now. That corresponds to 270 grams a second of water if you believe oxygen is equivalent to water loss. The age of the solar system is 4.5 billion years. That's 1.4 times 10 to the 17 seconds. That means over the age of the solar system, a loss rate, if we assume it's constant, big assumption, of 10 to, the 12 per, 10 to 25 per second gives 3.8 times 10 to the 19 grams of water. Or because the specific gravity of water is 1 gram per cc, at 3.8 times 10 to the 19 centimeter cubed volume of water lost from the surface of the planet. Just doing a, pi, two, a 4 pi r cubed times a, thickness, a depth at the Earth. That corresponds to a, over a uniform depth of seven centimeters of water over the entire planet. A little bit bigger at Venus because it's a little smaller in radius. And at Mars, 26 centimeters of water. Basically, less than a meter of water. That's not a lot. I mean, if you're trying to lose oceans, you're not losing oceans. You're losing cups. <laughs> you know, uh, so that's, again, Big assumption, that rate's constant. And we don't know how that rate varies over the life of the solar system. That's the question that we need to come back to. Right, escape velocities. This is the Earth, Venus, and Mars. These are escape velocities from the surface of the Earth in kilometers a second. Obviously, obviously Mars is much less than Venus or the Earth. For the protons, this is all fraction of an EV energy. Protons can escape. It doesn't take much energy for a proton to be gone. Oxygen has to be a few EV, 10 or 8 EV at Venus, and, uh, 8 EV at Venus, and only 2 EV at Mars. And I'll come back to this in a little bit. 
This just means that you, if you can get 2EV in a neutral, it's gone. And you can. It's a process called dissociative recombination. But for the Earth and Venus, getting 10EV or 8EV into a neutral particle just through chemistry is pretty well impossible. You have to have some other process, basically a physical process that uh, ionizes that neutral so that electric and magnetic fields that provide energy to a plasma can provide energy to that plasma, the ionized, pl ionized material, make it go to several EV, tens of EV, and then escape. So you need a plasma process for Venus and the Earth for, for things to escape. I'm going to talk about the Earth some more now. The pathways for loss, and this may be, again, going to Tom's question. For the high latitudes of the polar ionosphere, the cusp and clef, or the cleft fountain, either high energy heavies or essentially protons for most energies, basically have too high an, energy, too high a par an outflow velocity in comparison to the convection velocity that they basically either go escape fairly quickly or go down the tail and are lost because they never re-encounter the plasma sheet before the last closed field line. That plasma's gone. Lower energy cusp ions and also auroral ions that are already in, on closed field lines obviously are trapped, tempor at least for the time being, inside the magnetosphere. They form the plasma sheet and ultimately the ring current because we see oxygen in the ring current. And that circulates around. But as Jerry Goldstein was talking about, when you have dynamics, he was talking about the plasma sphere being eroded. But the same process that shunts the plasma sphere out through the day side will take particles that are outside of the plasma sphere, shove them through the magnetopause too. So change the dynamics, change the convection. You will lose part of the plasma sheet. You may lose part of the ring current. So that's another way of losing plasma out into the solar wind. The ions may also escape, I haven't shown these two because there's enough stuff on the sketch there. They may escape through charge exchange. Some of that charge exchange, well, that will make energetic neutrals. This will be the, what you vi visualize when you look at the, the neutrals through the image type of uh, observations. Some of those that are neutrals will go back into the atmosphere because they're in the, 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 way that, the direction they were going in when they were neutralized. The rest of them are just going to escape. They've got enough energy as a neutral to not be held by gravity. They're gone too. The only other, other part of getting back in is if you have pitch angle scattering, that puts the ions back into the ionosphere. So there's a lot of ways of both trapping, recirculating, but also maybe having uh, ionospheric escape, which we then think may ultimately be atmospheric escape at the Earth. I threw this in here. Um, this is from Scathe, partly as, uh, because um, the, the, the uh, video of Dick Johnson yesterday. For a few years uh, in the late 70s, I worked at Lockheed Palo Alto Research Labs, and I worked on the spacecraft charging at high altitude ion composition data, which is what's shown here. Uh, this is a Lockheed ion mass spectrometer going from 100 EV to 32 keV. This is differential energy flux plotted for about three or four, four or five days, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six days. Um, both protons and energy, uh, log differential energy flux. The colors are chosen so that basically the same color red is the same energy density if you integrate over the uh, pass bounds of the instrument. What's shown in this panel here, and I showed oh, the lines are drift path boundaries using a very simple unshielded convection electric field, dipole magnetic field. Particles up here are on closed co curvature drift paths. Particles inside the red lines here are on closed co rotation drift paths. Everything else are on open drift paths. And this is just a map marks the boundary between drift paths that are open through dawn versus open through dusk. So most of the particles in these spectrograms are on open drift paths. What is very curious, and I don't understand this completely, because this is not the right energy range to be the full ring current. I have a very strong correlation between the oxygen energy density and DST. That's what's shown down here. I did that just by analyzing all the data I had and just comparing it to DST. And what you can see is the DST is shown in the black line here, and the dark blue cyan is the energy density scale to DST using this parameter for all the ions, all the pro oxygen ions that are on open drift paths. The green is everything. So the difference between these two are the, drift, are the 
option eyes that are on closed drift paths. What is quite remarkable, especially here and here, and even over, a little bit over here, because there's a certain amount of local time aliasing going on, you see that these two excursions in DST are correlated with ions on open drift paths. Now, it may be the wrong energy to get you all the ring current, but there's some suggestion at least part of those ions are gone. And you see, they're here, this is a new injection, and they're gone there. These ions are gone. So, with respect to Tom Hill's question yesterday, there's evidence of ions that were in the magnetosphere aren't there anymore. That's a loss process to the solar wind. But it's also interesting that it correlates with DST. So anyway, now I'm going to go to the outflow process. Uh, I, this, is the pay, this is the Strange Retour at Art 2005 uh, scaling laws. And the only, I've just put it in there for completeness. And the only lesson I would have for anybody on these is um, don't put too many significant digits on your um, numbers. <laughs> <laughs> this does not warrant that significant, given those uncertainties that I've given there, that last significant digit is not warranted. So lesson learned for graduate students. Truncate your significant digits right, where the data tell you it should be. If it's not that significant, don't put all those numbers. But the other side is the, the stuff that, that uh, Brambles has been using and Bill Lotko, where they started to look at the alphane wave, the AC contribution to this process through the alphane waves. And this is just to show you that this, these are the alphane waves, past band limited, and they look both similar and different to the other parameters that I'm going to look at, and the scaling laws that Brambles used are shown in this figure here. And this also shows the other problem that we're going to have is, as before, the electrons in the alphane waves are themselves also correlated. So what you're going to find is, when I do this multiple regression analysis, what I've done is these are the slopes if multiple regret linear, actually the log log regression. So these are slopes from all those log log regressions. If this number in the right hand column is less than 4.21, then I have 95% confidence that that parameter can be ignored in the regression. That doesn't mean it's unimportant physically, it means it's correlated with something else that acts as a proxy for it. So, for example, I could get rid of the ELF waves in my correlation and it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean they don't do anything. They're the things that heat the ions to make conics. They're important physically. They're just not required to be parameterized. What is required to be parameterized, the most significant one, is the electron density, the precipitating electron density. That's the single most important factor because everything else correlates with those. But in terms of a causal chain, that's the hardest one to figure out because the electrons are both Precipitation from the cusp in the magnetosheath, in the cusp, but also processed on the way down, either through uh, trying to make field line currents, that's the, that's the inverted V stuff in the aurora, or the alphane waves themselves going inertial and having parallelic fields and accelerating the electrons as well. They're the ones that are most processed on the way down, and so it's hard in something like a global model to think how are you going to parameterize that factor when it's the least one that you have a handle on. There's also day-night differences, but this also wants to show you that the, the average, this is the black dots that you can barely see, does a, on a log-log plot, a reasonable job of representing the individual points. These are individual one-second points. The blue ones are night side, the red ones are day side. And you can definitely see that they want to follow this line, but they also want to stop at an upper limit, and they have a lower limit. I think that lower limit is almost certainly polar wind. It's a little higher on the day side than on the night side, but I think that's a reasonable number. Uh, fast altitudes a few times, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 per centimeter square per second. The other thing you see uh, is the flux has an upper limit. Day side, it's a few times 10 to the 9, a few times 10 to the 8 on the night side. Uh, so this flux saturation, and I, didn't I tested this at least for a case study where I looked uh, again on a this is a cusp that is in dark or closer to the terminator. I predicted the flux from that scaling law I did for the electrons, and I got the observed flux. They clearly go up and down in the same places. But the observed flux really seems to have a stop. It just goes up to a certain limit. That's it. You don't get any more out of that ionosphere. You are flux limited. This goes to John Foster's point yesterday, which is basically if you have something like a tongue of ionization that's bringing plasma 
horizontally into a region where outflows are going to occur, the rate at which those ions can go out is governed by the rate at which they come in. And so if you do some very simple numbers, let's assume the density is 10 to the 5 per centimeter cubed, let's assume the velocity is 1 kilometer a second, a little fast sometimes, a little slow other times, the net flux is 10 to the 10 per centimeter squared per second. And if I make an aspect ratio that's 1,000 kilometers wide and 100 kilometers high, guess what? I get 10 to the 5 per second. That number has reappeared. I've basically got the same flux number that I got before. And if I then say I'm going to have this go out through 1,000 by 1,000 kilometers, that gives me the total flux going out of 10 to the 5 per second, 10 to the 25 per second. You'll also get a similar number if you say, let's look at the top side density, about 10 to the 3, and the escape velocity of 10 kilometers a second. That's 10 to the 9 per centimeter squared per second, but escaping over 1,000 kilometers by 1,000 kilometers, you're back at 10 to the 25 per second. Same number. There's something going on in that must be telling us how this process works. And I just put in Andy Yao's figure just to remind you that's the 10 to the 24 here, 10 to the 26, those where those numbers are also coming from. But Andy's also had to integrate over uh, anything above 50 to 60 degrees, say 56 degrees invariant latitude over both uh, hemispheres. Unmagnetized planets. I don't know how much more time I've got. Um, for <laughs> um, okay. Unmagnetized planet, this is trying to give you an idea of what the different outflow processes are. The little wiggly lines are neutrals. I had to do, represent them somehow. And that's the reason why they tend to have straight lines. So what will happen, for example, a neutral come out, charge exchange, and then do this cycloidal motion as a pickup ion in the solar wind. Some of those pickup ions go back into the atmosphere and sputter neutrals back out. Some of the um, neutrals will escape directly at Mars. Not at Venus, but at Mars, it will escape directly. You'll also get the interaction of the solar wind directly with the ionosphere, where essentially you can think of the IMF acting like a cheese grater, just scraping the top of the ionosphere off and taking it down tail into the, uh, in, uh, being entrained in the solar wind. And last, at Mars, because of the magnetic field, you'll get magnetic anomalies. You may get auroral processes that will give you auroral out ion outflows like you have in the terrestrial uh, ionosphere in the auroral zone. Um, I've got to put this in here because this is important for, for Mars. Fox and Hach, and I'm sure, I don't know how to pronounce that name. It sounds, it's, a, uh, it's got an accent on it in the original paper. Um, so you take O2+, plus, combine it with an oxygen, uh, of an electron, that's an exothermic reaction. Energy is given up, and it's equally partitioned in the center of mass frame to both constituent particles. So if you take 7 EV, divide that by 2, that's 3.5 EV, that's more than 2, those oxygen ions are escaping. These oxygen ions are escaping. The rest of them don't get enough energy to escape. But this is one neutral process that would allow oxygen to escape from the atmosphere of Venus without requiring interaction with the solar wind. And the loss rates from this paper are about 2 times 10 to the 26, an order of magnitude larger than the plasma processes and also about an order of magnitude larger than the sputtering that Lumen and Kazara estimated for Venus and Mars. The dissociative recombination loss rate is obvious, therefore, independent of the solar wind conditions, but will probably depend on solar EUV, just because that will determine the ionization rate for O2+, and then the ultimate escape. I'll skip that. This is Landine's most recent paper, uh, 2013. I like this plot. This is one of the most interesting plots. It's a log-log plot with a linear regression. <laughs> here's the, re here's the, here's the, the regression that he got, and that's linear, basically 1 to 1.3, as far as I'm concerned. It's linear. And it looks like it's exponentiating on a log-log plot. It's sort of like <laughs> this. But it's really what it's doing. It's asymptoting to a straight line of, of unit slope, um, basically there. What he's trying to do is argue, this is for over the life of the sol our, current sol you know, our current solar wind. He gets a up to a few times 10 to the 25. And maybe for the young sun, where the EUV was much larger, you can start getting more like 10 to the 26 outflows of oxygen. But he also assumed a, a, an area that the entire tail and sum 
more was completely filled with the plasma going up, all going, all basically going downtail with to get that net flux of a basically 1.75 rm radius tail. So you can fudge that a little bit. For Venus, I'm going to skip Barabash's one because the, the follow-on paper was by Nordstrom et al. 2002-13, who did a very nice, careful analysis. And unfortunately, because this is dominated, this is the protons, this is dominated by the solar wind, and these are the heavies, but this green here is roughly the same as that green there, a little bit off. The yellow and the green basically match in terms of fluxes. And what he gets, and interesting, the tab changed. Um, the protons are about 15 times 10 to 24, 1.5 times 10 to 25 per second, oxygen about 4 times 10 to 24, a little bit less than stoichiometric, so it's not really necessarily water. But that number's still there, four times, a few times 10 to 24, 10 to 25. I'll let you, basically, if we take that number, and you think of the solar wind flux, you know, just for a typical solar wind velocity of 400 kilometers a second, um, you get about 4 times 10 to 8 particles for cent protons per centimeter square per second, just flux of the solar wind. If you take a 1 RV radius surface, just not ign ignoring so the effect of the bow shock or, the, or the, uh, uh, the true size of the obstacle, that gives you 5 times 10 to 26 per second through that circle. Divide by 16 to go from mass to oxygen, you get 3 times 10 to 25. That's that number again, 10 to the 25 per second. And this was just done by conserving momentum, remembering that once you've got the flux going, it asymptotes the solar wind, but the flux stays constant. You're not adding any more particles, so the flux stays constant. So I can basically relate the solar, solar wind momentum flux to the ion momentum flux, say the ion momentum flux must be less than solar wind, and that's how I get that number. So here's my summary. And, um, basically, everything's, these rates are the same, so does the magnetic field stop iron, and loss of an ion's atmosphere, and therefore, does it explain why the Earth is wet? I don't think so. I think we need to understand the early solar system much better than we do, and there's two effects that go trade off against each other. The EUV goes up, so the density of the, of the, of the ionosphere goes up, sure, but so does the solar wind that enhances the flux at the, at the unmagnetized planets, but it also increases the interaction strength at the magnetized planets, so it's not clear how those two dials trade off against each other when you try and change them. And I'm going to let you read the rest, and I'm going to be very self-indulgent and to put one last slide off and ask you, this is, this was 1976 in, in Britain, about the same time of the Yosemite conference. This was the MIST conference. I think it was an Aberystwyth, if I remember rightly. I am in that picture. You are allowed to guess where. Um, and anybody who worked in Britain will recognize a few faces there. I'll start right now. The assumption is that the point. The assumption is that A, the magnetic field is about the same size as it is now through history, which is not true. The assumption is that the atmosphere is composed of molecules and the gas, but not the rocks, which is uh, obviously much different. So I think you have a tiny slice of the problem. It's nice to focus on a number. It's very nicely done not nearly the analysis that's needed. This takes us back to global warming kinds of no, I, I, no, I, I, I absolutely agree with everything. You know, I've, done, I've not addressed anything to do with geological reservoirs, which is one of the big, I think is one of the big issues that I think needs to be really thought out more carefully when we do this. I don't profess to be an early solar wind, solar system individual. All I'm saying is, all I'm pointing out, people say, use these numbers that I've just put up there to say this is the rate at which water is lost from the non-terrestrial planets. And then they try and extrapolate that back into early solar system. Yes, There's Richard. a lot more than just what, obviously, I completely agree. All I'm saying is, given this information that we've got here, I have no way of knowing without a lot more analysis. Yeah. So it's very, nice, it's very nice to pin them down by saying you have too simplified an analysis, but it doesn't lead us forward. 
okay, I, I take, I, 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 the, the artist has to go forward and it requires understanding the early solar system, what the sun was like in the early solar system, what the solar wind was like, right. and what the reservoirs were. Ti time out, written. gentlemen. Sorry. And by the okay. way, if you didn't know, I'm right there. <laughs> time out.